Question by Robert Lloyd Joff. A man stopped me and asked, Who are you? I told the man my name. The man said, I did not ask your name. I told the man I am the son of my mother and father. The man said, I did not ask whom your mother and father were. I told the man that I work over there. I did not ask what you do for your living. I asked if he knew my children or my wife, and he said, I did not ask whose father or whose husband you are. I asked, who are you? I stood and remained silent. To whomever you are, welcome to the wonder. Our first song tonight is called Wood and Nails by Porter's Gate uh, Hymn Singing Collective. I invite you to join in singing with us.
Whenever we gather together to worship, we in the Lutheran tradition always gather honestly. The beginning of almost every worship service I've ever been a part of, we confess our brokenness. We confess the ways that we fall short. We confess the ways that we malign this beautiful, good creation. And tonight, as we talk about identity, there's nothing more sort of malignant than the way many of us look at ourselves when we look in the mirror. And so tonight, as we confess our sins, Caitlin is going to spend some time writing on our mirror, writing some of the thoughts that we know that you have when you glimpse your reflection in the mirror, thoughts that do not do justice to the beautiful work of God in you. Let us confess. God, here is what we really think. We do not like what you made. It's just not good enough for us. In fact, we would like to make some revisions. For instance, why didn't you just make us a little better? Why didn't you make us a little more interesting, a little more talented, a little more beautiful, a little more athletic, a little more successful, a little more intelligent, a little more stable. Frankly, God, when we look in the mirror, we think you kind of messed up. Because when we look in the mirror each day, or even when we look at the faces of our neighbors, we only see this shallow picture of who we are. And so all we care about are the marks of beauty or not. All we care about are the mistakes that we cannot forgive or the flaws that someone else pointed out. And it gets easier and easier to see these things when we focus on the surface. And so, God, we miss everything. We miss the miracle that is living and breathing and waking each day. We miss the gift that we are to others and the gift that others are to us. We miss the beauty of ordinary moments, thinking that life is supposed to be extraordinary all the time. We scroll through Facebook, Instagram, we snap, and all of it is a constant state of judgment. And God, we miss out on the beauty all around. Forgive us. Amen. And now as you hear these words of promise, I want you to watch, watch as all of these sins that we carry that cover our very image are wiped clean by Jesus Christ. So hear these promises. The cool thing about following Jesus is that we don't have to play this game anymore. We don't have to look around trying to find our identity in physical appearance or success or fame. I mean, with Jesus, our identity is constant because our identity is in Him. It's right there in His love for us. It's right there in the way He reaches into our lives and He touches the lives of others through us. It is in who He says we are when He calls us beloved and worthy and a miracle. So, beloved, your purpose, your meaning, they are not dependent on what you do, the grades you get, the jobs you land, the house, the cars, or the toys you bought. Your purpose, your meaning, your identity depend only on the one who never stops calling you beloved. Amen. Next, we'll sing a song called New Name. Give me a new name. Send me in a family. 
family Pull me out of my pain Never walking out on me You've given me a new name You told me that you love me You sent me in a safe place You are my security You're singing over me You're singing over me You're singing over me The song of love You're singing over me You're singing over me You're singing over me The song of love This is my new name This is where you brought me Living in a wild place You're making me a masterpiece you're singing over me, you're singing over me, you're singing over me, song of love. You're singing over me, you're singing over me, you're singing over me, song of love. And this is my story, this is my song, this is my perfect father's love. chapter 16 verses 13 through 20 now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples who do people say that the Son of Man is and they said some say John the Baptist but others Elijah and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets he said to them but who do you say that I am Simon Peter answered you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. Then he stemly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. One of the things that stands out to me about this story is the way that identity is formed. Uh, in the text right away, Jesus is asking a question about identity. Who do people say that I am? Uh, and when Peter gets it right, my favorite thing is that Jesus turns it around immediately and gives Peter an identity. He says, you are Peter. He names Peter. And then he describes what Peter's purpose is on this earth through Jesus. And so as we're thinking about identity tonight, uh, in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Lisa was talking about this really cool concept that she read in a book. And if she was here, she would explain it to you a thousand times better. Uh, but the book is called The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. And in it, you know, she's talking all about gathering and sort of the importance of gathering and how we gather. And there is a concept called the 15 toasts in the book about how to like turn a normal gathering into something much more meaningful. So basically, it's like you invite people over to your house, but instead of just inviting them and maybe telling them what to bring, you also give them a topic and everybody brings a story 
from that topic, and then at the dinner table or after dinner, people go around toasting, sharing their story about that particular topic. And so I thought it was a really cool concept, and even though we're not having a dinner, and even though there's not 15 of us, I figured we could do the three toasts tonight. And so when I invited the blends to this worship service, I also asked them to bring a story about identity. So Caitlin gets to go first. Cool. Uh, when I think about identity, a uh, main thing sticks out to me because I had a pretty pinpointed identity from the age of nine to 19. So in those years, the thing I was the most was an athlete, specifically a basketball player. And that identity was in every single piece of my life. It's something I worked really hard at. Every day after school, I could not wait for the bell to ring at 3.15 so I can go to practice um, and play the sport that I really loved. But I made it be all who I was, and I wanted everyone else to know me as the basketball player or the number five that I wore for every game. And this was so much in my identity that it helped me and made me decide where I was going to go to school. Huh. Just to um, go to Bismarck to play basketball was the only reason I chose that school. And it was really crazy because that's all I was. Like Olsen, number five, basketball my whole life. And then going to college and playing on the Bismarck State team, it was still exactly who I wanted to be until I realized there was so much more to me. And I realized after getting out of the small town I grew up in that not everyone saw me as just a basketball player. Other people saw me as funny or good at English or these other things. And I realized, oh, these people do not care that this is the sport I do. Some people don't even know. Mm. And so I actually only played basketball for one year. And I realized I have so many more talents and other things in my life that I'm passionate about. So I switched my scholarship from an athletic scholarship to a performing arts. Cool. And then I did other things in my life because that identity was luckily no longer the only thing I was. Did that feel liberating, like to go from one sort of narrow identity to a much bigger identity? Oh, for sure, because like I said, I like, lived for the sport and as soon as it wasn't there anymore um, I got a really cool job at an after-school program so I got to hang out with kindergartners all day which was the best and I got to be in plays like the diary of Anne Frank and I met different people that were outside of my basketball team and it definitely made me a more full person as you were telling the story and you were talking about your number five it was surprising to me that I remembered my sports numbers <laughs> and like you were way more of a sportser than I am. Uh, I played like in fifth grade, but I still remember I was number 25. But yeah. that identity is like strong. It matters. My email was CaitlinOlson5 at gmail.com. Don't email that though, because that's not my email anymore, but. <laughs> Which is like the last thing I was gonna ask you about. Like, so Olson5 was a big deal. Oh yeah. You're no longer either. Well, no, not really. Um, I'm Caitlin Olson Blend, but right. like a number means absolutely nothing in my life anymore. Hmm. When five was like everything to me. I scribbled it on all my notebooks. I had it on like keychains. It was embroidered on my clothes. And now it's just like a number in my dresser. Did you know her as a basketball player? Like, when, did you know uh, her in that time, Carter? I did not. I did not. I met her after she had decided to not pursue basketball anymore. And so, that's really weird. I mean, I got a face full of basketball when I when I <laughs> initially had met her. Like she was still basketball, basketball, but she wasn't playing at that time. Um, it wasn't. She was in that transition of her identity. Do you, uh, yeah, that's really interesting because you quitting basketball means like everything that's happening in this room happened. Yes, fully. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wild. And now I can't get her to play basketball at all. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Is it too hard to like recreate something that you're no longer as good at? Well, it's different. Like I love competition. I mean, we all know that about me. Yeah. But it's like not the same. Right. I don't know. There is something about it that just doesn't feel as full as what it used to be. So I don't really want to. And plus I beat him all the time. So it's like not fun right. for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Cheers. We don't have anything to thanks. toast with, but cheers. <laughs> Carter? Uh, for me, the I guess the number one thing that I would identify with and anybody would identify me as just looking at me or even seeing a picture without even meeting me, without even hearing a word out of my mouth, um, they would view me and identify me as a white male. Hmm. Um, I've been a white male my entire life and I will choose to be a white male for the rest of my life. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's just one of those things that you are just born into and it's what I've been and I, I do, and now that I'm older and I've matured and I'm able to see the world around me in a different perspective, um, I think it's uh, really important as a white male to recognize and realize that like in today's society, there's some underlying and um, there's just some underlying privileges that you get that come along with just being a white male. Um, and I just, I don't know, I feel that that's just important to recognize those and not necessarily take them for granted. Yeah. Do you remember when you first sort of recognized that you had some privileges? Like, can you pinpoint any time? Uh, yeah, I grew up um, like a mile out of the, my hometown and my closest friend was my neighbor across the little, across the little field or whatever <laughs> that connected our houses. But. Um, they, he was also a white male, but his parents had adopted four African-American uh, children. And I, I guess just at like a young age, I kind of just, it was something in it was just like, it kind of clicked. I was like, these are, these are black kids getting raised in a white household. Mm. And I saw the kind of perspective of like, how their life is going to turn out compared to like how it would have turned out if they weren't adopted or if they were in a different situation or a, um, their typical situation, I guess. Um, so, but yeah, but now that I'm, now that I've, I'm older and I see like today's society, like it's definitely a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a hard, that's a, one of those hard identities. It, it, we, some people at St. John have been doing an anti-racism book club. Uh, and the first book we read was called White Fragility. And it's a diversity trainer who wrote this book who worked for many, many years in corporate America talking to corporations about racism. And the thing she talks about a lot in the book is like the first thing that's hardest to do is to get white people to recognize that they're white. Yeah. Um, you know, there's sort of a lot of people sort of live their life without ever really thinking about their life racially, whereas people of color are born into having to always think about their life racially because um, of the dangers, because of the percep perceptions of others. So, yeah, yeah it's really, that's a, that's a helpful way of thinking about identity. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> uh, How about you, Joe? Yeah, I was thinking, um, I think there are a lot of transition points in identity. Like Caitlin talked about the basketball transition from basketball life to post basketball life. I guess I had the same with trumpet, but that's like not even nearly as cool as basketball, so I'm not going <laughs> to talk about that one. Uh, what I am going to talk about is like I am experiencing a major transition right now in my life. And I can't say that it's super easy or super fun. Um, for 30 years of my life, I was uh, not a father. And. <laughs> With being not a father came just like a ton of freedom, a lot of freedom to like choose, make my own identity, you know, and the way I am in my personality is that I like felt like I had a lot of worth if I like knew cool things or I knew how to do cool things. And so my whole life I've been learning new tasks, new skills, new knowledges, like learning how to play many instruments, learning how to build a computer, learning how to brew beer. Uh, these things sort of helped me feel like I, I was worthy or something because I could accomplish a lot of things if I put my mind to them. And now, like in the last six months, I don't have any time or energy to like learn anything new. Uh, and in fact, I've 
I've been given this amazingly beautiful child who is like such a mystery and such an impossibility to figure out. He's not like any project I've ever had before. Like when there's a problem, there's no like, there's nobody that knows the answer. I mean, there's some people who try to help. But when he's crying, he's crying. And, you know, I, I, so I, I, for me, I'm living in this moment where I'm adjusting from this identity of trying to find my identity and the things I can do. And, and I'm like learning that my identity now is like sitting in a living room watching my son roll over and like being okay and happy with this identity of a very ordinary life. Because even though it's ordinary, it's still really important. So I haven't really thought through it super clearly. I just know that I'm experiencing this sort of painful transition in this moment. I think we all do in those times. Uh, do, you, do you feel like pressure to like uh, have pressure on yourself to put forth or find a solid identity to be impressionable to your kid at all? Yeah, that's a great no, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I sort of know deep down that, you know, a kid loves his, a kid's parents and the love is the most important thing. But I do wonder, <laughs> I, wonder if you, yeah, I wonder if you wonder, you know, I know you don't have kids yet, but like, you know, I don't really know how to use a chainsaw. <laughs> So like, I'm not gonna be able to teach my kid how to use a chainsaw, and I do think about that. Like, I don't know that skill. So I do feel like some of those things are missing from how I've created my identity that I might not be able to pass on. But then I guess, like, luckily, I know other people who do know how to use a chainsaw, and they can teach us together, I guess. Yeah, chainsaw club. <laughs> also off of that, I know parents often project this life they want for their kids. Mm. Do you have any projections of what identities you would want your son to have? It's also a really good question. Um, no, you know, no, I have no imagination. Uh, like, I have no imagination for like what he might be because I'm so open to the possibility mm -hmm. of whatever he will be. And you know, we're going to get to this in a little bit about what is our identity and those those things that we do, those things that we're good at, those things that we're successful at, those things that we're passionate about, like I don't actually think those are identities. And I guess having my son has really taught me that like, I mean, babies can't do anything. I don't know if you knew this, but <laughs> <laughs> they cry and they sleep and they poop. And none of that's very impressive. And like, I love him so much. And that's taught me a lot about, like, I don't think we create our own identities. I think our identities come from love. Yeah. And for me as a Christian, I've always been drawn to this part of following Jesus. That, you know, in Jesus, I always have this identity of being loved. And obviously I have all, these, all this baggage in my own life about what I think is worthy and what I think is successful and what I think is a good identity to have. But Jesus doesn't care about any of it. Jesus looks at us with wonder and amazement and loves us every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you know there's, a, there's a really important verse in Galatians chapter 2. And if you haven't seen my devotion from the Badlands, I encourage you to check it out. But in uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul makes what I think is one of the most important claims about what being a Christian is. He says, For I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And I know that, like, looking at older, wiser people, you can tell that there's a less of them, and that there's more of, like, Christ spilling out of them. And I think that's, like, a, a lifelong journey, but it's one that Christ is committed to in us. So that's our little toasts about uh, identity and a little message about Jesus and your identity. Uh, and so for you, as you're reflecting today and this week, you know, reflect on those things that you sort of think create your identity. But then I also want you to remember what the experience is like to be loved unconditionally, sort of recognize that that's a much more full and reliable identity. Okay, we're going to sing a song a little bit about this. It's called, Who You Say I Am.
important as Christians that we say who we are, and one of the things that defines who we are as people who follow Jesus uh, is in our creeds, it's in those statements of what we really truly believe, like deep in our souls, deep in our hearts. Uh, but all creeds sound different, there are creeds all over the place, and so our creed tonight is going to sound a little bit different, but should still be fairly familiar to somebody who has Jesus in their heart. We believe in God, the creator, who created and is creating everything. The universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us. Each of us, unique, individual, and beloved of God. We believe in God, the Christ, who saved and is saving everything. The universe, the world, the plants and the animals, and us. Each of us, unique, individual, and beloved of Christ. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who guided and is guiding everything. The universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us. Each of us, unique, individual, and beloved of the Spirit. We believe that this one God in three persons is present among us, working directly in our lives and the lives of all who are born into this world striving to bring us back into harmony with all creation and with God, forgiving, healing, touching everyone, never rejecting any who willingly receive this freely offered gift of love and grace and eternal life. Amen. Thanks to a pastor, uh, no, a, a music minister named Lisa Friends for that creed. 
At this time, I want to invite you, if you have something like a mirror with you, uh, or if there is somewhere in your house or wherever you're worshiping with us that is reflective and you can at least catch a glimpse of yourself, uh, I would invite you to now uh, take a look at yourself uh, in a mirror or in a reflection as we sing together, Take, O Take Me As I Am, and pray some prayers while we do it. your image in my image. Remind me that the standards of beauty in our culture never compare to the beauty you have given each life, including mine. Take, oh, take me as I am So men are what I shall be Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. God, thank you for making me, making me, me, for the unique quirks, for the passions in my life, for the skills I have, and for the way I love others. You have made me on purpose and for a purpose. Take, oh, take me as I am Some man I would I shall be Set your seal upon my heart And live in me God, I know I am not perfect No one is for the mistakes I've made, for the times I fell short, for all the ways I failed to recognize the beauty. Thank you for carrying me through. Thank you for accepting me just as I am. And thank you for your love each day. Take, oh, take me as I am. Then I would I shall be Set your seal upon my heart And live in me Take, oh, take me as I am So then I would I shall be Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. At this time, if you have any bread or wine or juice at home, I invite you to get it out for communion. Hear these words. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. 
He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You're welcome to commune with your family. If you're alone, uh, I would like to say the words of distribution to you. So dear beloved, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. I invite you to join in singing the song, You Are Mine, as we reflect on our identity in Christ and this gift of communion. And I will come to you in the silence you from all your fear. You will hear my voice. I claim you as my choice. Be still and know I am here. I am hope for all who are hopeless. I am eyes for all who want to see. In the shadows of the night, I will be your light. Come and rest in me. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me. I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. I am strength for all the despairing, healing for the ones who fell in shame. will see, the lame will all run free, and all will know my name. Do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me. I will bring you home, I 
you all to take a deep breath. Consider yourself. Think back upon your day and all the decisions that led you to this place. I invite you to repeat after me. May I feel safe. May I feel safe. May I feel content. May I feel content. May I feel strong. May I feel strong. May I live with ease. May I live with ease. Now think of someone whom you love very much. Parent, partner, sibling, child. Consider the way you feel around them. And repeat after me. May you feel safe. May you feel safe. May you feel content. May you feel content. May you feel strong. May you feel strong. And may you live with ease. May you, may you live, live with, with ease. ease. Think of someone who you rarely think about. Stranger, person that cuts your hair, fellow employee at work, kids' teachers. Repeat after me. May you feel safe. May you, may you feel, feel safe. safe. May you feel content. May you feel content. May you feel strong. May you feel strong. And may you live with ease. May you live with ease. And finally, think past the people whom you recognize, past the familiar strangers to unfamiliar strangers near and far, people with lives just like you who want safety and contentment just like you, who want to feel strong and live with ease, who share the same wishes and hopes and dreams that we have as human beings. Repeat after me. May they feel safe. May they feel safe. May they feel content. May they feel content. May they feel strong. May they feel strong. And may they live with ease. May they live with ease. And may all of us everywhere feel safe and content and strong and live with ease. Amen. Amen.